So here we have a double integral of xy square root of x squared plus y squared. We're integrating over a rectangle 0, 1 cross 0, 1. Now the main computational tool that we have for evaluating double integrals is Fubini's theorem. Fubini's theorem says that we can turn a double integral into an iterated integral. We can also integrate in either order. We can integrate with respect to y first, or we can integrate with respect to x first. So a good question to ask when you set up an iterated integral is, is one order advantageous over the other? Usually this comes down to looking at the function that we're integrating and asking, could I integrate it with respect to x? Could I integrate it with respect to y? Is one of those easier? Is one of those impossible? In this particular case, uh, I, don't, I don't think it matters. The function is symmetric in x and y. It looks exactly the same from either perspective. So in this case, I would say no. But you could have an example where it's much easier to integrate with respect to x first or something like that. In this case, it doesn't matter, so we can just pick one of the variables to integrate with respect to first, say x, and set up the iterated integral. So this integral that we care about, double integral, by Fubini's theorem, if I integrate with respect to x first, my x bounds are 0 to 1. Both bounds are 0 to 1, but in particular the x bounds are from 0 to 1, and then we'll integrate with respect to y second also from 0 to 1. This is now an iterated integral, and completing this problem is just a matter of evaluating each single variable integral from the inside out. Okay, so to do that, we start on the inside. Pretend that y is constant, and integrate this just with respect to x. Let me call this i1. In particular, if I'm looking at this integral, the variable is x. I need to figure out how to integrate it. I'm tempted to make a substitution because I have a composition of functions here with the square root. And I can also see that if I were to call, say, u, x squared plus y squared, du is going to be like 2x dx. And I've got an x dx sitting out front. So for this first integral, I'm tempted to make the regular one variable substitution u equals x squared plus y squared. Again here, y is a constant because I'm only integrating with respect to x. So when I compute du, du is going to be just 2x dx. Okay, and what does this integral turn into? So I'll do a couple things in one go. First of all, the x dx here, x dx, this is 1 half du. So I'll pick up a factor of 1 half out front. These outer integral bounds I'm not going to touch for now. Then we have our inside integral. The x dx I absorbed already, we have a y here that just chills. And then the square root of x squared plus y squared that's the square root of u, du dy. And then the new bounds for the u integral, when x is 0, this is the lower bound here, u is y squared. And when x is 1, u is 1 plus y squared. y is a constant here, so I can pop it out front, and the antiderivative with respect to u, this is like u to the one-half, so the power rule says this is going to anti-differentiate to u to the three-halves divided by three-halves. So like I said, that y is a constant, so it'll move out here. Antiderivative is going to be u to the three-halves over three-halves. And then I'm evaluating that at my bounds, which are up top, 1 plus y squared and y squared down below. 
And then after we plug in these bounds, we have a regular single variable integral to evaluate. So let's see, 1 half divided by 3 halves is like 1 half times 2 thirds, which is a third. And then what do we get inside the integrand here? We still have this y. And then I plug in 1 plus y squared for u. That'll give me 1 plus y squared quantity to the 3 halves minus plug in y squared for u, and we'll get y squared to the 3 halves. And like I mentioned, this is just a regular one variable integral that we just have to figure out how to do. Probably at this point, I would break this up into two integrals. I would distribute this y, and I guess distribute the 1 third as well. So in the first chunk here, we would have a y times 1 plus y squared to the 3 halves dy. I'll split that up. And then minus 1 third times the integral of here. I've got a y squared to the 3 halves. That's y cubed. And then when I distribute this y, I'll have a y times y cubed, which is a y to the fourth. This second integral is very easy to do. The only thing we have to worry about now is this first one, which looks a little scarier, but it's not so bad because here we have another obvious composition of functions to which we could apply a substitution. So let me call this i2. And I would say for i2, I want to make the substitution. I won't use u since I already used u. Um, we could use, oh, I don't know, s. I would let s be 1 plus y squared. Then ds is going to be 2y dy. And if I continue from above, get a 1 third y dy. y dy is 1 half ds. So I'll pick up another copy of 1 half out front. And then I've got s to the 3 halves. Then the new bounds, when y is 0, s is 1. And when y is 1, s is 1 plus 1, which is 2. So that one looks easy to do from here. And then this other one we can evaluate very straightforwardly. y to the 4th, the antiderivative there is going to be y to the 5th over 5 plug in 1 and 0, and we're in the home stretch. So here I've got a 1 6, so I'll just finish it off really quick. Antiderivative of s to the 3 halves is going to be s to the 5 halves over 5 halves, evaluated at 2 and 1, minus, here when you plug in 1 you'll get a fifth, when you plug in 0 you'll get 0, so this is just a third times a fifth, plug these in, and up to simplification, which I don't really care about doing, we're done. So this will be 1 sixth times 2 fifths times quantity, plug in 2 here, 2 to the 5 halves, minus 1 to the 5 halves is just 1, and then minus a 15th. And there you go, we're done. Like I said, if you want, you could simplify it. I don't care about simplifying. That's the correct answer. It looks pretty gross, but it's correct. And we've evaluated the double integral. This next example is to evaluate an iterated integral from 0 to 1 and y to 1 of sine of x squared dx dy. What's the point here? We could conceivably try to evaluate the integral as written. In other words, we could try to integrate with respect to x first, get something, and then integrate that with respect to y, and then we'd be done. The main problem here is that integrating sine of x squared with respect to x is very difficult. And you're welcome to try finding the antiderivative here, but you won't have much success. So what do we do? We use Fubini to change the order of integration and integrate with respect to y first. 
Now we have to be careful because the inner bounds with respect to x are variable bounds. They depend on y. So the thing that you cannot do is just literally switch the order. If we just literally switch the order, we would get something like this. This iterated integral is completely incorrect and doesn't even make sense. You can think about this in a couple different ways, but if this were to actually make sense, your final answer would be in terms of y. That doesn't really make sense at all. This iterated integral is a number. It's like 5 or something like that. So we can't have a final answer which depends on y, which is what would happen here. In any case, doing this is completely incorrect. And this is the thing that we have to avoid. So if we can't do that, what are we supposed to do? In problems like these where you have to reverse the order of integration, you really need to think about the region that you're integrating over. You need to draw a picture or something and figure out how to re-describe the region in the other order. So the region we care about is described by two bounds. The inner bounds give us x boundaries. The upper bound is 1 and the lower bound is y. And the outer bounds give us y boundaries. The upper bound for y is 1 and the lower bound is 0. Let's draw a picture and see if we can figure out what this region looks like. So here's our coordinate axes. We're told that the y value ranges from 0 to 1. So y equals 0 and y equals 1. These are two horizontal lines given by the green lines that I just drew. The other boundary conditions that we have here are, on the one hand, x is constrained to be below 1. So the equation x equals 1 would be this vertical line here. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, is this inequality right here. This says that the boundary condition is y equals x, which, if we were to draw that line here, we would get something like that. Ah, so the region that we care about is between the blue lines and between the green lines. This means that the region we care about is this triangle. That's the region we're integrating over. And we have to figure out how to describe this in terms of y first and then x. Now, geometrically, describing the y bound first is going to amount to fixing an x value and describing the bounds that we integrate in the y direction. Fix an x value, describe these bounds. Fix an x value, describe these bounds, etc. The slices that we're integrating over first look like this. And the point is, is that if we fix an x value, it looks like the lower bound for y is always 0. But how high up do we travel? Well, it depends. We always travel until we hit this blue line, but that blue line has variable height. The blue line here has equation given by y equals x. Again, we got that from the equality condition in this integral. And this gives you the upper bound for y. We can see that the lower bound will be 0. The upper bound will be x. So when we apply Fubini's theorem, we'll start off with the integral that we were given, which was sine of x squared in the order x and then y, with bound 0 to 1 and y to 1. By Fubini, what we're going to do is we're going to change the order here. The integrand stays the same. We want to do y first and then x. And what we decided over here is that when we do y first, the lower bound is given by 0, y equals 0. And the upper bound is given by y equals x. Having done that, we've integrated over all of these purple slices. And then we have purple slices living from here to here. So the x boundaries, after switching the order of integration, are going to go from 0 to 1. 
And there you go. This would be the correct way to switch the order of integration. And again, this is really important. You have to notice that you can't just switch the order of the variables and bring the bounds along for the ride. So will almost certainly be incorrect unless you're integrating over a rectangle or something like this. When we switch the order to y and then x, our bounds completely changed. And just a quick principle to keep in mind here to check that you've done this correctly is that anytime you have an iterated integral like this, the outer bounds should just be numbers. You should never have variables in your outermost integration bounds. For example, here you had a y in the outermost integral and that's incorrect. So a simple sanity check to run when you do this is if you've done things correctly, you should end up with just numbers on the outside. Okay, so now we've done the hard work. We've switched the order correctly. From here, this is just a matter of evaluating the iterated integral like we've been doing. So let's get started. Having changed the order, the inside integral is trivial to do. We're integrating with respect to y, which means x is a constant. So this expression here is one big constant. And when we integrate with respect to y, we'll just get y times that constant. Plug in x and 0 for y. I'll get x sine of x squared minus and then plug in 0 for y you get 0 so that whole term goes away. And now we've got a straightforward single variable integral to do. Probably do a substitution I'll let u be x squared and du is 2x dx. x dx is then 1 half du so I'll get a 1 half integral. Change the bounds when x is 0 u is still 0 when x is 1, u is still 1, so the bounds actually remain the same. And this is sine of u du. Antiderivative there is going to be negative cosine of u. Evaluated at 1 and 0. There we go. Plug in 1, we'll get negative 1 half cosine of 1. Who knows what that is? Minus Cosine of 0 is 1, so this is like plus 1 half. And I think I did that last part correctly. Again, doesn't even really matter. In a problem like this, the important step is recognizing to do this and changing the bounds correctly. In any case, we get this and we are done. We want to set up two different iterated integral expressions to get the area of this region here. So let me call this region E. Now we know that the area we want to compute is going to be the double integral of 1 over the region E dA. What we want to do is we want to take this double integral and turn it into an iterated integral. The problem is that this region here is neither vertically simple or horizontally simple. It's not vertically simple because if I think about integrating slices in the y direction first, the upper bound is not consistent. I do have a consistent lower bound given by y equals x squared, but there's a kink in the upper bound. So the failure of being vertically simple is the fact that there are multiple pieces in the upper bound. But likewise, it's not horizontally simple because of the right-hand side bound. If we think about integrating in this direction first, there's a consistent lower bound given by the blue curve, but the upper bound in the horizontal direction has a kink the upper bound has two pieces. So unfortunately this shape is neither. What that means is that if we want to set up an iterated integral in either direction, we'll have to split the region up into two pieces first. So first let's integrate with respect to say y first. 
let me bring up a picture here again. Again, to integrate with respect to y first is to say that we'll be integrating slices that look like this, which means we want to decompose this region into vertically simple regions. We could achieve that by dividing right down the middle where this kink occurs. Once we do this, this weird pizza slice here, maybe I'll call this E1, this is now a vertically simple region because there's a consistent upper bound and a consistent lower bound. Likewise over here, if I call this other triangle looking thing E2, this is a vertically simple region. It has a consistent upper bound and a consistent lower bound. So the double integral that we care about, we could split up over two regions. This is going to be the double integral over E1 of 1 dA plus the double integral over E2. And we have two different integrals to work with. So let's work with E1. We decided that we want to integrate with respect to y first. So I'll set this up as dy dx. In E1, I fix an arbitrary x value, and then I ask, what are the bounds in the y direction? Well, I start at the red curve, and end at the blue curve. So the lower bound here, y in terms of x is given by x squared. The lower bound will be x squared. And the upper bound given by the blue curve is gonna be 4x. And then we've integrated with respect to y, so I don't care about that direction anymore, and I can squash it out. To get the correct x bounds, I squash the picture and I only look at the resulting interval in the x direction, which is going to be from here to wherever this intersection point is, right here. The lower bound, it looks like, is 0. 4x and x squared definitely intersect at 0. And then we just have to figure out where this intersection point is. This happens when the blue curve, which is 4x, equals this brown curve, which is 2 minus x. Solving for x, it looks like 5x should be 2, so x is 2 fifths. And there's the upper bound in the x direction. There you go. So this is an iterated integral, which gives the area of E1. Then we do the exact same thing for E2, and then we're done. So I integrate with respect to y first. For e2, the lower bound for a fixed x value is x squared again. But this time the upper bound is given by the brown curve, which is 2 minus x. And then again, we've integrated in the y direction. So I squash out the y direction, and I just get this interval. I begin at this intersection point that we found earlier. So the lowest x value that we're integrating here is 2 fifths. And then when we squash this region onto the x-axis, I'll drop down to here. Visually, it looks like this intersection point is 1, but we can check really quickly. This will happen when 2 minus x equals x squared. And by inspection, if I plug in x equals 1, this checks out, I get 1 equals 2 minus 1 is 1. So the upper bound here is x equals 1. Oh. That is one iterated integral expression, which gives the area of this region E. And again, we approach this by integrating with respect to y first, which means we want vertically simple regions. So we had to chop it up in the middle like this. What if we want to integrate with respect to x first, though? This is going to be really similar, except now we want to decompose the region into horizontally simple regions, because we'll be integrating like this first. To decompose this into two horizontally simple regions, it looks like we need to chop it in this direction at the kink given by this intersection point. So here I'll call E1 this top triangle, and I'll call E2 this bottom piece. 
So the area that we care about is again going to be the area of each piece added together. And then we want to set each of these up as an iterated integral integrating with respect to x first. So let's do that with e1. This time I've got a dx dy. To integrate with respect to x first is to fix a y value and determine the x bounds. Well, it looks like the lower x bound is given by the blue curve. The equation of the blue curve is y equals 4x, but to get a bound for x, we need to solve this as x in terms of y. So the blue equation is the same thing as x equals y over 4. That's going to be our lower bound. Same thing with the upper bound. The upper bound for E1 is given by this brown curve, which has equation y equals 2 minus x. If I solve for x, this is the same thing as x equals 2 minus y. And here's our upper bound in the x direction. To get the y bounds, we've integrated with respect to x, so I can squash the x direction away and project this E1 region onto the y-axis, and when we do that, we would have an interval from here to here. This interval is going to determine the y-bounds. It looks like the lower bound is at 1. Again, we can verify that because the x value here was 1, and if I plug in x equals 1 into, say, this red curve x squared, I get y equals 1 squared which is 1. So this lower bound is indeed 1, and the upper bound here is the corresponding y value of this intersection point. In this part we found that the x value was 2 fifths, so the y value is going to be 4 times 2 fifths, which is 8 fifths. So the upper bound here will be 8 fifths. And there you go, there's an iterated integral which gives the area of E1. We'll do the same thing for E2 and then we're done. So I'm integrating with respect to x first, which means I fix a y value and I look at my x bounds. The lower bound is again still the blue curve. Earlier we figured out that that was y over 4. Now the upper bound is given by the red curve. Again, because we're describing x in terms of y, I need to take the equation for the red curve and solve for x. I get x equals the square root of y, so that's our upper bound. Then again, to get the y bounds, I take the region E2 and I squash it onto the y direction because I've already integrated with respect to x, and we're going to get this interval. Earlier we figured that the upper bound here occurs when y equals 1. So I'll put a 1 here. And the lower bound, the intersection of the blue and red curves, occurs at the point 0, 0. So the y value here is 0. And we're done. There's another iterated integral expression which gives the area of this full region, this time integrating with respect to x first. Mm -hmm.